Father, we do thank you that uh, nothing, nothing can separate us from uh, the love of God. Um, Lord, we thank you uh, for the promises in your word. Um, and Lord, we, <laughs> we thank you for your word. God, the very, you are creator God, and uh, we uh, have faith that uh, you spoke the world into existence. And uh, Lord, you have made it um, possible that your word was uh, written down and that it was uh, sent. And Lord, we have the completion uh, of uh, the revelation of, um, of you and of, of Christ Jesus that is uh, needed uh, for life and godliness, Lord, as, as things pert pertain to them. And uh, Lord, uh, not only of, of salvation and reconciliation of mankind, but, but how in history, Lord, you are sanctifying your holy name. You are demonstrating your righteousness. Lord, you, you are glorifying who you are even when we're mixed up oftentimes in our mind about who you are. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for truth. We thank you that it's your truth, uh, and it's not based on uh, our opinion uh, or even our misconceived uh, ideas, Lord, but, uh, but Lord, we thank you that you love us enough to, to bring the truth to us uh, and, um, and to bring, uh, Lord, not just in word, but in deed and in, in demonstration of the cross of Christ um, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and uh, Lord, we thank you for that so much, and uh, Lord, may we um, bring glory and honor to you as we continue to worship you uh, through the study of your word, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week, uh, we, um, excuse me, we, we started chapter five, I think we were ending there in um, uh, verse, we got around to uh, verse three, and um, uh, before we start, though, let me take a look um, again. Uh, here's our, our, our visual outline for the book of Romans, and um, again, all of this is, is dealing with the righteousness of God, and how God has revealed his righteousness to mankind. First, we looked at the doctrine of sin, and uh, we understood sin in light of the scripture and what it reveals about mankind and uh, our, um, our nature now uh, uh, to uh, rebel against God. And we looked at the condemnation and the need for God's righteousness, which brings us to the eternal plan of God for salvation. Uh, we learn about this also in Ephesians 3.11, uh, that it was always in the eternal plan of God uh, to, to save all of mankind, not only, uh, not only Israel, but also all of uh, mankind. Um, we're getting ready to transition from justification, which is the imputation of God's righteousness, into uh, sanctification uh, in chapter 6. But what we're looking at today and what we've been looking at is all a part of, of the, um, you know, the basis of our sanctification. Uh, and we'll take a look at that in, in depth today. And here's where we're going. Uh, we will look at that future hope that we're talking about in, in, um, in chapter eight, uh, the hope of the glory of God. And then uh, nine through 11, we'll be dealing with God's sovereignty, Israel's past election, Israel's present rejection. This is the state we're in. Uh, or the state that Israel is in right now, but there is a future salvation uh, that we're looking forward to. And, uh, and so, of course, then we begin chapter 12. And, and Paul, we hear his cry as he's taught us all these things. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice. This is, this is what we're getting to is, is our service and behavior. But all of this, the first 11 chapters deal, um, deal with uh, God's righteousness being revealed, the vindication uh, through his sovereignty of the nation of Israel, and then 
This is application 12, 16 through 7. So again, because of these things, Paul will say, um, you know, he, he pleads with the, with the believer uh, in, in how they ought to behave. So um, Romans, Romans uh, excuse me, chapter 5, um, we are looking at the benefits of justification. And uh, chapter th- three is where we left off. I'm gonna try and wrap all this all together um, from last week where we had to stop early and today um, I'm gonna try and transition in there. So Romans five, and again, this is all for the demonstration of God's righteousness and um, um, we're actually dealing, that highlight is, is um, um, we are looking at the glorification because that's what we look forward and hope to, but this is, this is um, we're really studying right now the sanctification, um, middle tense, salvation from sins, everlasting effects. So Romans 5 then says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappointment, disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen? Amen. And so we looked last, last week then how, how this hope should affect us. You know, how does this impact Christian living? Uh, what, you know, to be, having been justified before God, then how, how does this affect our day-to-day living? And Paul says here it's, you know, not only do we glory in the hope of the glory of God, but we, we rejoice or we glory in tribulations. And we looked at the word rejoice, to, and it means to celebrate inwardly, uh, which uh, in the Greek, the same Greek term is used for rejoice and glory in these two ver- verses. Um, and then we looked at tribulations and tried to get a grasp on, on what this is, you know, what it means. It simply means, you know, uh, pressure, outside pressure, distress, oppression, affliction, pressing. It, it means of distress that is brought out about by outward circumstances. I thought this picture illustrated a pretty good idea of the pressure, you know, and this is what, you know, as a believer, we can, we can learn to, to glory in these tribulations, but only in, in light of, in, in knowing what tribulation has the possibility of producing. And so it's not a guarantee that these things are going to produce because we can choose not to glory. We can choose not to rejoice. You know, we can choose to let the circumstance, the pressure overwhelm us and uh, to where, you know, instead of becoming, I've heard it said, you know, instead of becoming better, we then become bitter. You know, instead of, instead of allowing our, um, you know, the Lord to work in us and through us and, and, and keeping him in sight, we, we, uh, we allow these things to take charge uh, of, you know, over us and overwhelm us. And so we just looked at a few verses, or a few different versions, excuse me, of uh, translations of this, um, just to show that, you know, the, the interchangeable words here. Um, so... And we also looked at the fact that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, but, it's, but we don't glory in hope of tribulations. Make that distinction. It's not that we're hoping for tribulation, uh, but, but the fact is we can rejoice. And then we looked at the false doctrine of the prosperity gospel. Uh, and, we, and we made the distinction uh, between how, you know, they say that you, you should not be having uh, uh, tribulations if you are a truly a believer, you know, if you're, if you're truly a child of God, you're not going to face tribulation, you know, and, and, and again, you know, the basic thing is that they say is have faith in faith. In other words, faith has an intrinsic value, you know, it, it, it your, your faith can press upon something and change something, but, but what we believe 
and what the Bible says is that we have faith in God. It's extrinsic value. We have faith because of the object of our faith, because of who God is. And the fact that he has made promises and all through the Bible he has kept true to his promises. And so we can rest our faith in the fact that he has paid for the sin debt in full as far as it pertains to justification. And we can rest our faith in God and in his work in Christ Jesus' cross work on the cross to pay for our sin. But we can also trust God then even in life in our sanctification. So it's not intrinsic faith but rather in extrinsic. And as Jesus says in Mark eleven twenty two 22, plainly, have faith in God. So, just as Abraham believed God and it was credited or accounted to him for righteousness, it wasn't Abraham believed in his belief, it wasn't Abraham had faith in his faith, it was Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So then, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and, and so we looked at the word knowing, to know by intuition or perception. Uh, basically, this is an experiential uh, knowledge. You know, Paul is writing, saying, look, know these things, you know, uh, either, either by trusting what I'm telling you, or, you know, again, you can test it yourself. And uh, if, if we learn to do these things, then this is what uh, is produced. So let me get get caught up here. So, uh, we looked at perseverance, and you know, what is perseverance? Uh, excuse me, it's the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. Uh, so, we can uh, learn to persevere when trials come if our, you know, if we have hope, if we're trusting in the future outcome, if we're, if our mind is uh, resolved in God's sovereignty and in the hope of his promises. And, um, and we looked at this quote by John Whitmer. He says, this is a spiritual glorying in afflictions because of having come to know that the end product of this chain reaction that begins with distress or tribulation is hope. You know, again, this, we're gonna look at this word hope today uh, even uh, in further uh, detail. And, uh, and James tells us then, he gives us the example. He says, you have heard of the per perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And this is the key, is always keeping the end in mind. And so we got somewhere in here, and we're just gonna pick up here. And it says, and so he says, um, and perseverance, so, so we rejoice in tribulation. Um, uh, we also rejoice in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces uh, perse perseverance and perseverance character. So, and, and this is proven character, okay? This is character that has been proven through the distress, through persevering, and it is developed. It's not something that is inherent. You know, you know people don't, aren't just naturally going around in the natural man saying, man, I, I can really glory in this tribulation that I'm going through right now. This is only brought about by, you know, uh, the miracle of God that was performed through uh, his salvific work and understanding his faithfulness and, and looking forward in hope. This is the only way that this is made possible. Because when we you know, as, uh, when we believers learn to persevere through tribulation by rejoicing, the result, according to the Bible, is proven character. A son or daughter of God gains character by learning to persevere through that tribulation. You know, and various distresses will produce various characteristics. You know, faith, value, all these different things are produced, you know, a depending on, on, the, uh, on the distress. And so, and so then, you know, we are defined, our character is defined then by how we respond to the tribulation. And uh, I just wanna say, you know, um, Paul commends young Timothy on his character. And there are many that we can use, you know, of course, we think of Job, we think of, we think of Paul himself, um, but, but Paul commends Timothy in Philippians 2, 19, uh, th through 22, he says, and, and listen to this, he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus 
to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. So you hear this, you hear Paul's heart here. He's wanting to know the state because he's away, he's sending this letter uh, to, to, to the church at Philippi, and, and he's, he's, he's hearing of things, and he says, but I want to know your state. For, but he says about Timothy, he says, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Now that's not a, he's not saying, excuse me, he's not saying this about Timothy, but, but what he's saying, he says, for all seek their own, not the things which are of, of Christ Jesus, but you know his, Timothy's, proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Do, do you hear Paul here? and his love for Timothy, and the proven character that Timothy displayed when he served with him. And when he means he served with him, he was in that persecution with him. He served with him in the gospel. When he brought the gospel to places and was, you know, uh, persecuted, Timothy was there, you know, at this point when Timothy came along, and he was there with him. And so, he knows Timothy's ability to pers persevere, and he knows Timothy has that future hope in mind, and he knows that his care is for the church at Philippi. And so he's, he's seen this, he's witnessed this, this character has been proven even to Paul. And, but he says, notice, I trust in the Lord Jesus, because he sees Jesus at work in young Timothy. This is, isn't something Timothy's conjuring up and trying to, you know, but because he says here, all those, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. That's a depressing statement to have to make. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. They want to please men. They want their own self to be glorified. They're not interested in the gospel of Christ, and they're not interested in you. They're interested in themselves. And so Paul says, I'm sending Timothy to you because I care about your state, and I know he cares about your state. So, so this is, you know, this is, this is knowing then, again, this proven character. And so that's kind of what that character can look like. You know, and what should our response be then when circumstances you know, are outside of our control? And of course, we need to be faith resting in God's promises. You know, he is the faithful and true. And, uh, and Paul, I think this is about where we, where we stopped last week. He says, we do not, and, and, or we, we do not be conformed and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, and these things are learned. You know, again, it's, it's and it takes time. Um, and again, who has this, if anybody is truly glorying in their tribulation, um, it, it's the, the possibility is there. I don't diminish that. And it is more than possible. It is doable. Uh, but again, these things take time. Um, but Paul says then, um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't let the tribulations in this world conform you. Don't let that build your character. Rather, allow God's promises and his word to transform your, you know, your, your mind so that you are conformed to his character you know, and that's, that's the, that's the goal, that's, that's what we're looking for, is, is to have fellowship in the suffering of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. So perseverance and tribulations builds proven character, and character hope. And again, as we've looked at before, the definition of hope, biblical hope is an expectation of good, an expectation of good. And here's another 
definition, hope is the looking forward to something with some reason for confidence, respecting fulfillment, specifically of Christian expectation. And that's, that's according to uh, a Greek-English uh, lexicon. And so, so it is looking forward in eager expectation of good. And so far, what we've studied in verses three through four of Romans, it all pertains to and has to do with our spiritual growth. But unfortunately, spiritual growth um, is not something that is, uh, you know, God doesn't just, okay, you're grown up now. No, we go through these trials practically through our progressive sanctification, and this is the purpose of tribulations and various trials that are sent into our life. It's, it's for our benefit to learn to trust in him. And uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum explains the conditionality of the believer's growth. He says, when believers in, enter into periods of trials or tribulations, they should realize the benefits of those tribulations or of their tribulations. The promise is that through these trials, God is going to produce spiritual character in the believer he is going to reproduce in the believer Messiah likeness. And the process follows four steps. First, the believer enters a trial. Second, if he appropriates the grace available to him during the trial, it will result in patient endurance. And, and third, if the believer patiently endures the trial that he is in, his spiritual character will be proven. And fourth, the approved spiritual character will result in a state of hope, expectation of good. Um, so, so now, then we, we start to see, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, a conditional uh, thing. We can, we can trust God at his word and say, look, I... These circumstances are overwhelming, and I, I have no idea. We could just be completely honest with God, and, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to, I don't know the outcome, but you do. And, and I know, again, when I operate in your grace, uh, when I appropriate the grace, and I trust you, and I just rest in you, and I'm resting my faith in you, and I know, according to your word, that these things, you know, uh, can be produced then, um, you know, and I know the end. You know, that's the key. I'm looking forward to the end. It is not just Messiah likeness, but being, you know, our minds focused on, on heaven. You know, and I, and I have to say, I, I really appreciate, this on a personal note, I, I, like, I like Johnny Cash and uh, there was a song that he sang, and I can't remember if he wrote it or if he recorded it, and it went something like, you know, you've been so heavenly-minded, you've done no earthly good, and I just have to say that's, that's the worst mentality ever. Uh, you know, we, the Bible instructs us to have, um, you know, to look forward and, and to have that heavenly-mindedness, um, you know, because that's, that's our hope. That's what produces our hope, because otherwise you know, we're smack dab middle in tribulation, and, and where is our attention going to be? It's going to be right on the thing in front of us. So, William Newell also observes, he says, so now we find that not only does the believer look back to peace made with God at the cross, at a God smiling upon him in favor, and forward to his coming glorification with Christ, but he is able we are able also to exult or rejoice uh, or glory in the very tribulations that are appointed to him. And now, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but, but when we get to chapter 8 of Romans, Paul is going to expound further than uh, on the future hope, as we saw, of, of glorification, you know, the, the salvation from sin's very presence. And in 8.18, he says then, For I consider, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy 
to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Again, notice the focus on the future hope. And he says also on 8, 28 through 30, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And Paul is writing this from a positional standpoint that the fact, you know, the assurance is so much that it's happened. He writes it as if it's happened. And this is our positional truth. And, uh, but again, while we're living, while we are in this world, we have tribulation, as the Bible has told us. We will have tribulation. That's a promise. And most people don't teach that. You know, again, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, if you're having tribulation, then it must be because you're in some sort of sin. It must be because, you know, uh, of, you know, are you praying? Are you reading, brother? You know, are you, you know, all these things and missing the fact that, that God is wanting simply his kids to grow up. You know, he's simply wanting them to walk in the grace that has been given to them. He's wanting them to, to have a relationship, not only with him, but that this is being, um, you know, outpoured onto uh, the primarily uh, one another in the church, the body, and how we minister to one another, but also out into uh, the world. So, he also says in Colossians, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. That seems to be an instruction to focus on things which are above. You know, and this should remind us of Matthew, you know, um, to seek, you know, um, things above, not on things below. You know, where moth and rust uh, destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Uh, but this is, you know, this is the same mentality. It's seek those things which are above where Christ is. And where is Christ? Sitting at the right hand of God. So when we're going through our tribulations, where is Christ? Our high priest is seated at the right hand of God. Okay? Okay. So when we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we're oppressed and all these things, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now that should bring great hope. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in God glory. Amen. And praise God. Praise the Lord. That's, that's what we focus on. You know, we, we look at God's word. We allow God's word to change our mind about these things. And when we're in these tribulations, and guess what? We're going to be in them, and guess what? We're going to fail. But guess what we get to do? We get to run to the throne room of grace. Lord, I... You know, I failed again. And before, you know, again, you know, as we sang earlier, it's, you know, he comes out, you know, he's, he's, he's waiting in that anticipation for us to when we realize that and simply look to him for, you know, to receive that grace in our time of need. And so, so then tribulations refine our hope. And tribulations again, are given for the sanctification of the believer, and God has then an intended purpose in mind when he allows his sons and daughters to go through tribulations. This we must know. So it is through tribulations that God grants us, again, 
the opportunity for spiritual growth, the opportunity for spiritual growth. Additionally, tribulations make clearer the reality that this world is not our home. God's word explains to us in the book of Hebrews, he says, for here we have no continuing city or permanent city, but we seek the one, that one city to come. You know, in this world we have no permanent city, but we seek the one to come. So as we learn to rejoice in our tribulations, we learn to persevere. And when we persevere, proven character is developed and proven character produces hope. Now, he goes on to explain and he reiterates this, hope does not disappoint. But again, this, is, this needs to be understood in biblical hope and not as the world hopes. It's, and the word disappoint is understood as a, a shame that is brought upon a person due to unfulfilled promises. You see how they relate. So it's a shame that is brought upon a person due to unfulfilled promises. Uh, you know, Kenneth Boa makes this remark. He says, some things we hope for in life and do not come to pass. When that happens, disappointment sets in. Disappointment produces discouragement. Discouragement, unproven character, because now we're acting according to that, dis that dis uh, disappointment and discouragement. And unproven character, despair. You know, that's, that's the end of... of uh, you know, when we hope in things uh, that are, um, you know, not based on, um, not based on the promises of God. So, uh, also, in Psalm, or in Proverbs, uh, Solomon writes, he says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So, if our faith is directed at any object other than God or the promises of God, there is no true hope, is there? Now, however, biblical hope is a product of God's grace. So, biblical hope is a product of God's grace. Because of the grace of God, we can resolve or rest our faith in God's promises. And because our faith is grounded in God's grace and not dependent on our faithfulness, our hope of the glory of God does not disappoint. And I don't know if you notice here, but hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So hope is closely res related to desire. So let's, let's chew on this, let's think about it. Because there are at least two types of desires you know, within us. There's our natural desires and God-given desires. And when we you know, try to understand natural desire, we need to recognize that some of our desires you know, we, we use the term good and, and bad, but they're kind of, some of them are natural desires. You know, for example, I hope to get a job. I hope to get this job. I, I hope to go to college. I hope to do well in college. I hope to get married. You know, these things, uh, I hope to get rich. Um, these things are, you know, natural desires. It's not that anything is bad about that desire. But what we need to understand is our desires need to be tempered and they need to be brought into subjection to the will of God. That's the main point in all this. You know, that's the main point. Because again, you know, what Paul will say, you know, resulting in all this, and it's not wrong to have these desires. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that these things are bad in that sense. But when these desires exalt themselves above the will of God, that's when they become an issue. So, so these things need to be brought into subjection to uh, God's plan and will for your life. So the question should be, how do we discern, you know, between natural desires and God-given desires? Because you can be given a desire by God, but the timing might not be right. 
you know, there might need to be, um, you know, uh, some discipleship uh, before, you know, something transpires or, um, you know, again, um, there may be a waiting period. And that's, you know, that's like, our, oh, I don't want to wait, you know, because we live in a society where everything is, you know, I mean, we have images coming at us at crazy speed speeds, you know, through the internet, through TV, through media, we have all sorts of things that we hear, and, and, and everything is just so quick these days, and we're, you know, just bombarded with all, all of this information, and we want to react, you know, we, we want to see something happen, right? But uh, a, a good question then to ask is, what is the motivation behind my desire, okay? Is it for self-gain? Is it to benefit the body of Christ? Is my desire to please God or to please man? And on top of it all, the word tells us the heart is deceitful above all things. You know, we're talking about the deceitfulness and craftiness of the serpent this morning, but the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, thankfully, the prophet Jeremiah doesn't stop there, and he goes on to reveal that I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So here's my suggestion. Patience. We patiently wait upon the Lord. We allow the the Lord to search our hearts and to test our minds through his word, through prayer, through one another. If you have a good sister, a good brother that you trust in Christ, hey, this is, you know, this is, this is something, you know, again, uh, again, but, but we still want to lean, you know, into the Lord. Uh, but, but some things can, you know, come through confirmation. And this is, you know, one of the reasons that we, uh, we're not to forsake the assembling together because, you know, a lone Christian can, and I've been there, I'm not condemning people that are, have done that or in that because I've been there and I know this, knowing this then because if you isolate and you start to, you know, and you think you're doing great, you know, or whatever and your relationship with the Lord is good, but, but you know, we can, we can get ourselves into, um, uh, a bad situation, you know, and it's, it's not, it's not good for us to, to be there, and um, it, it's, you know, we need to be a part, we were designed to be a part of the body of Christ, and to function in, in his body, and to be, you know, uh, not just for ourselves, but for one another, and, um, you know, because my sin affects all of y'all, and, and your sins affect all of us, you know, and so, because we are the body of Christ. And, uh, you know, and some will say, well, then it's just better for me to be by myself. No, no, it is not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, you, you will, it's, it's not a good spot to be. I've been there. But patiently waiting upon the Lord, we, we can begin to understand then, we can begin to understand the motivation behind our desires. And, uh, and this is just, again, this is just to see David's heart, you know, God said that he was a man after his own heart. And in Psalm 139, 23 through 24, David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Can you hear his heart here for the Lord? And to know, to know that the Lord knows him, try me. This is that testing. This is that try me and know my anxieties. Bring it to the light. Because if you know them, of course the Lord knows them. But see, this is what happens in prayer is that oftentimes the Lord will reveal that motivation behind what that desire is in your heart. Then what do you do with it? You bring it to the Lord, and you thank the Lord for bringing it to your attention. And now this can be dealt with. I see, I see that this desire 
you know, was not from, it, it was, you know, the motivation behind it anyway was, you know, something to do with me, and I need to, I, you know, God changed that desire. So, so because then, uh, or excuse me, um, Christian hope then, you know, our hope is not based uh, it, or is, is based, or should be based, I should say, on God-given desires. Because this biblical hope, or this Christian hope, when it's based on God-given desires, it, it, it comes through knowing the promises of God and becoming pliable to what the Lord desires. And again, he writes, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. This doesn't mean what you desire he's going to give you. This means he's going to put them there. When you delight in the Lord, do you see the conditionality there? This is, this is something that God gives you. It, again, it comes through knowing the promises of God, you know, what has God promised in his word, and becoming pliable to what the Lord desires. So God places... Um, or excuse me, God can replace, rather, and God replaces our natural desires with godly desires as we delight ourselves in Him. You know, when, when we begin to know Him as He is revealed in His Word and we consider His desire and His desire for us, our minds change and we begin to, to desire what He desires. So this is, this is all, this is the living word of God that can, that can change us. This, you know, in and of itself, in changing the mind, even of the believer, because the change of mind for justification is one thing, but now we have the world systems, all that we know in our culture and society and all these things. How do they, how do they align with what God's word, if we trust that God knows what's best for his kids, then as we, as earthly fathers, knew what was best for our kids as we gave them instruction, then our creator, God, again, you know, we, our minds change and, and as we have this relationship with him and, and they're conformed then uh, to, to his desire and no longer is it my will, but thy will be done. And I can glory and trust in the fact that I can just sit back and rest, trusting the Lord, you know? And uh, if the Lord calls me to, okay, let's go do it. Okay, you know, now I want you to do so. Okay, let's go do it, <laughs> you know? It doesn't, it's not a, it's not a, you know, and, and here's the reality, right? It's like you go home and, you're, and your toilet seat is leaking. <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, you leave church, you go home, or even before you, you know, you get out the door, you go and you shut the, do the, the door of the car, and then, you know, I, I slam, you know, we slam the door too hard, or, you know, somebody's something, you know, and then it's uh, off to the races, right? So, so the reality is, again, this is, this is something that we experience, you know, moment by moment. We are, we are constantly, you know, learning to bring ourselves back to, okay, you know, so what? You know, the house burns down, uh, blows up, whatever. Glory to God, you know? What are you gonna do, Lord? You know, I'm, I, get to, I get to glory in the fact, and, and this world's not my home anyway. This is light and momentary affliction. It's, 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 a, it's a vapor, you know? It, to us, it might seem a long time, but but in the eyes of eternity, and when we're trusting in that hope that is the eternal state, then that's, when we're focused on that, that's, you know, that's where we can just, you know, things happen, and, you know, I'm just, my eyes are on the prize, you know. I, I'm going to see my Lord and all his glory, and I'm going to be like him, you know. I don't know what that is, but we know we're going to be like him, and, and that's what we're looking forward to, and that's eternal. That's not momentary. So, so again, another blessing made available to us through Jesus Christ is that we have been given a hope that does not, does not disappoint. Hope will deliver. 
And how do we know this? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. Another blessing of justification is the love of God. And the love of God is, it's, it's, of, the, it's of the love of God and Christ to humans, agape. This is the agape love that many of us know and understand, but the, the, this use of the noun is epitomized in the affirmation that God is love. This is one of his infinite attributes. And of course, it's understood with, with all of his other attributes and how it operates. But the fact still remains, uh, agape love is selfless, it's sacrificial, it's unconditional. And because... Uh, or in sense it is an attribute of God, the love of God then is infinite. And so how do we know agape love? By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And Paul tells us in Romans 5, 6, as we'll, as we'll see uh, hopefully next week, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. This is agape love. This is love that does not need something in reciprocation. It's not based on how you're going to react, but God loved, and he died for the ungodly, and this was the demonstration of his love. So consequently then, what is the believer's positional relationship with God? If God died for us when we were ungodly, and we've believed him, and we've trusted him for salvation, what's our position now as a child of God? Again, we have peace with God. You know, back up uh, back up to, to Romans 5 there, having been justified by faith in verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ Jesus died for us and we trusted, he, he saved us, his blood uh, paid for sin's penalty, and we trusted Christ and we trusted, um, you know, in God. These, these things uh, result then in peace with God. We no longer remain as we read about in 118, we no longer remain under the wrath of God, but rather the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the striking contrast? Who was given to us, the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And, and so instead of receiving what was deserved, which was eternal condemnation, by God's grace, we have received the love of God. And this, again, should give us great hope. We should be rejoicing in the fact that God has graciously given us what we don't deserve. You know, the love of God should give us that eager expectation of the future promises of God as revealed in his word. And a little Greek has been poured out is in the perfect tense, passive voice, and indicative mood. And remember, the perfect indicative describes a one-time completed action with ongoing effects. The love of God has been poured out in the past, in our hearts, when we believed, and this does not need to be repeated. And the effects of God's love being poured out in our hearts is ongoing. And we need to learn to operate in this love because it wasn't just for us, but to also be spilled out on others. And this is, this is where we learn of God and we learn of his love and we learn how to operate in it by his grace and we learn to express it. And so the, the phrase means, has been poured out, cause to be emitted in full quantity. Cause to be, I, I love this, cause to be emitted in full quantity. Quantity. God's love has been emitted 
in full quantity, brothers and sisters. We can experience and operate again in this love only when we abide in Christ. We can't do this in our natural. Just like we can't hope in our natural, we can't do this in our natural. This is as we abide in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit because we've been given the Spirit and it's the Spirit of God that has poured out this love in us. And um, it's a quarter after. I'm, fortunately, we'll have to stop there. But, um, but do we see now, you know, what hopefully we be, should be able to start seeing all these things because of our justification that have been given to us and these are for us to be able to operate then um, uh, within this grace for us, for our sanctification, but also for us to be uh, ready for service, you know, because God at the end, he, he wants to use us. He wants, us to, he wants to use us to bring glory and honor to him. And as an ambassador of Christ, not ourselves, but of Christ, an ambassador of Christ. And, you know, when an ambassador is in a foreign country and they're operating as an ambassador, you know, their reconciliation, reconciliation, you know, we're to bring this gospel of peace, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of reconciliation to the lost world. And that's out, outside, outside of the body of Christ when we are to operate. That's how we should, you know, remember we are ambassadors of this, of the hope you know, of, our, of this future hope of the glory of, of uh, God, you know, hoping that, you know, we want them to, uh, to be a part of that and to, to be glorified with God, you know, to be saved from this eternal condem- condemnation and, and, and rather than receiving the wrath of God, receiving the love of God. And so, you know, God, give us this desire, Lord, change, change our hearts, Lord, so that we Lord, just get us out of the way. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would um, um, check our, as, as David prayed, Lord, search us and know us, Lord. We, we, we want to be sure, God, that our, our desires, the motives of our hearts, Lord, unlike, unlike hope that is based in, in your promises, but the things that we desire to do are, are kept in check according to uh, what it is that you desire for us, Lord. And because sometimes, even though they might not be bad, they could ultimately affect um, what it is that you want for us. And it can delay things. It can even delay our spiritual growth. Uh, it could cause us to miss out on an opportunity of ministry. Uh, so, Lord, these things matter, and so, uh, Lord, we, we, we trust you, and uh, Lord, we ask for grace and learn to operate in this grace, and um, as you've dealt graciously with us and as you have loved us, Lord, may we graciously deal, uh, especially to those of the household of faith, but also, Lord, in, in expressing and, and, and sharing the gospel message, Lord, may we, uh, m- may it be motivated from, uh, from love for them, Lord, not to get them to behave a certain way, Lord, but to, to as s- salvation is in a state of emergency, Lord, to save them from the wrath that is to come. And, uh, and Lord, so uh, give us love, uh, that agape love that you loved us with and that you love the world with uh, for, uh, for those that are just like us that are sinners, Lord, but we are saved by grace and we have trusted you and that's the only thing um, that's different is that our hope, our faith, our trust is is on you. And so, Lord, we we love you, we thank you uh, because you loved us first and, uh, Lord, be glorified as we continue to sing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.